morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, March 8th, 2022. And on this episode, I'm talking about government-run, government-based, legalized highway robbery, what the government people love to call civil asset forfeiture, but specifically a federal version of this program, this ripoff called equitable sharing which has been unconstitutionally nationalizing local police, giving them incentives, paying them off to do it. Ever since a guy back in 1984, who was at the time a senator from Delaware, helped give us the program back then. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And I just learned about that part of it yesterday. So it just kind of hit me like, oh, man, everything police state that we're facing today kind of links back to the same guy. Well, a lot of them. Anyways, first of all, before getting to this, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow us. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. There you're going to find all the archives of the show on individual episodes. I publish a blog post for each individual episode. You can find all the platforms that that individual episode is on. We live stream on a bunch of mainstream video platforms like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch, but we also live stream at the decentralized censorship resistant odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. That's a very important platform. We archive the video as many places as we can. And we also have the audio only podcast edition where we're reaching more people than I ever thought we would. Uh, plus, you can also find our membership program on that show homepage, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, in case I have not mentioned it enough. And you can find all the stuff that I mentioned, the links and reference that I'm going to references that I'm going to go through today about civil asset forfeiture and the federal equitable sharing program. Uh, so you can see exactly what's going on, how they implement it, how they use it to get around state restrictions on the police state as well. But first of all, I want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat while we allow people another minute or so to get notifications to join us in uh, the live show. It takes sometimes these big platforms. They're not as fast as we'd like them to be. But uh, hi to Senator DT, Sharon Patriot. Andy Blue, Dave Simmons, Cowboy Roy Rogers, and everyone else, that Liberty gal, I appreciate you guys being here. I will look back in the chat a little bit later today and see if there's any questions or comments, maybe a little bit later in the episode if I don't go too uh, too wordy today. Daniel Blanchett, good to see you, buddy. Alan Mosley as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. But let's start this out. And I want to do a quick overview first of what civil asset forfeiture is. There's actually two types of asset forfeiture. One is criminal. And one is civil. And we're primarily focusing on civil asset forfeiture. Under criminal forfeiture, they say, well, if you've been proven beyond a reasonable doubt that you're guilty of a crime and that your crime led to the gain of certain assets, then you may lose those assets. But on the other hand, and this is from our State of the Nullification Movement Report, page 78. I'm citing page 78 and 79, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. I will link to it in the show notes. Here's how we put it. On the other hand, civil asset forfeiture does not require a guilty verdict. In some states, it doesn't even require the owner to face criminal charges. In this process, the property itself is literally charged with a crime and is the subject of the legal proceeding. And because of that, we've gotten some weird sounding case names. And we found this through Institute for Justice, IJ.org, which I will cite in just a moment. But there's some cases like State of Texas versus one 2004 Chevrolet Silverado, because the state is filing a claim against the car because the car committed the crime, I guess. Or United States versus one solid gold object in the form of a rooster. These are legitimate cases out there because they're charging property with criminal activity in essence. Property owners, we write, must then prove that the property wasn't involved in criminal activity in order to get it back. Sounds backwards, doesn't it? This flips due process on its head, forcing the owner to establish the property's so-called innocence. This shifts the burden of proof from the state to the citizen. It's so unconstitutional at every level, both on the federal level, and I can't imagine any state constitution authorizing such garbage, but who knows? I live in California. There's Illinois, New York. Who knows? Possibly. 
Anyways, here from IJ, we know that this is used quite a bit, and this is just a brief overview. I've been, done a bunch of other episodes on our show homepage, 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty. As you scroll down through the page, you see a bunch of different categories on things, the 10th Amendment nullification strategy and history, uh, essential history lessons, but there's a section on the police state and civil asset forfeiture, and you can find other episodes there as well. But here's how IJ put it. They do the best work on civil asset forfeiture of any organization out there, even us. And they say, by any measure, our data shows that forfeiture activity is extensive nationwide. In 2018 alone, the year for which we have data from the greatest number of states, 42, D.C. and the federal government forfeit. So 42 states, D.C. and the federal government forfeited over $3 billion. $500 million was forfeited under state law and $2.5 billion under federal law through the DOJ's and the Treasury's forfeiture programs. And I'll get to how those work out, what agencies participate in them, and how state and local law enforcement get involved and how they participate as well. Looking at fewer states, but over a longer period, they note 20 states, DOJ and Treasury forfeited over $63 billion from 2002 to 2018. This is civil forfeiture, not criminal. $63 billion, $21 billion under state law, and nearly $42 billion under federal. And a lot of it becomes federal when the states restrict the process. All of a sudden, everything becomes a federal case, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I covered in some detail, the, well, not too much detail, but in an episode a few years ago, June of 2019, asset forfeiture is theft. It's also highway robbery, legalized government robbery, an overview of the state and federal programs. I will link to that one in the show notes, and that way you can get a little bit more detail on what those are. But now that we're talking about the fact that there is a federal asset forfeiture program. I want to go back to 1984, that Orwellian year, which is Orwellian in reality. We got the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984, Public Law 98-473, blah, blah, blah. Enacted October 12, 84. It was the first comprehensive revision of the U.S. criminal co code since the early 1900s. It was heavily, it was heavily, if not primarily focused on the unconstitutional war on drugs. It was increasing penalties and it focused, especially if you're talking about the war on drugs, they really were focusing on cannabis, on a plan, not even other stuff. It increased penalties on marijuana cultivation, possession and transfer. And then it also established, this is for the first time, it established a new federal civil asset forfeiture program called Equitable Sharing. Stipulations about using civil forfeiture to seize assets of organized crime. And of course, they want us to think that these types of things will only be used for the bad guys. Just like we were told the Patriot Act was just going to be used for the terrorists, the income tax was going to be a temporary wartime measure just for the richest of the rich, a tiny percentage. That was that, That's what it always is. It's just going to start out as just getting the people that we think haven't paid their fair share, their dues, of course. And of course, this civil forfeiture process known as equitable sharing. And why is it called that? We'll get to that in a moment. It's only to seize assets of organized crime. And I was looking at this and I noticed that it was uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Strom Thurmond and is signed by former President Ronald Reagan. And then I looked at the co-sponsor list and what a surprise but a Senator Joseph R. Biden from Delaware was the first guy who signed on as a co-sponsor on August 4th, 1983. Other people like Orrin Hatch, Edward Kennedy, but usually the, the first people that sign on, those are the ones who worked with the sponsor. And of course, with the Republican president at the time, you had to have a Republican primary sponsor. Otherwise, I guess in my mind, it could have been, it doesn't matter. All these people were the prime sponsors of the bill. Uh, Alphonse D'Amato, I don't have even heard of this one, but Hatch, Kennedy, Biden, Thurman, these are the people, along with Reagan, who gave us this increase in the drug war, and it also gave us equitable sharing. What is that? Here from NCSL.org, National Conference of State Legislatures, I believe it's what it is. They say equitable sharing allows state and local law enforcement agencies to transfer seized assets associated with federal crimes to federal agencies which then carry out the forfeiture proceedings. It just sounds like they're going after criminals, right? Once the assets are successfully forfeited to the federal government, the proceeds are deposited into an appropriate forfeiture fund, 
And state and local uh, agencies then receive a percentage of the total, depending on the specific type and circumstance of the particular case. They get the feds take a minimum of 20 percent and the states get up to 80 percent. And many times it is 70 to 80 percent. What really happens then is you're basically saying local law enforcement. What they're acknowledging here is that the feds don't have the person power or the resources to enforce federal laws or regulatory programs, period. And they have to have this forfeiture program in order to incentivize local police to participate in federal enforcement efforts. And when they do that and they throw back the cash, the local law enforcement does most of the work. They collect the information they do the investigation. They take the stuff. Sometimes there is almost no investigation or any of the normal police work. And then they call up their buddy in the ATF or the DEA. I know we're talking about drug war, but those two are definitely hand in hand. Gun control is a tool of the drug war. And they work. They call up their buddies, their partners. They call them their federal partners. And they say, well, we've got a federal case here. They transfer the, 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 the case to the feds and then they get all this loot out of it. And the ATF specifically tells us why it exists. It exists to create basically a national police state. I'm surprised that my formatting here, let me see if I can get this to show up on the screen. Here it says, there's two reasons. The attorney general shall assure that any property transferred to a state or local law enforcement agency the first has two things. They have two qualifications in order to make this work. One, it has a certain value that re is rela uh, relatable to the specific crime in question, even though they're not talking about having criminal activity or being convicted. But two, it will serve to encourage further cooperation between the recipient, state or local agency and federal law enforcement agencies. So the ATF is specifically telling us that the DOJ's civil asset forfeiture program called equitable sharing where local law enforcement acts on behalf of the federal government and then gets 80 percent of the loot out of it they get a payout out of this this is to facilitate cooperation in other words to turn local law enforcement into agents of the federal government and when they join federal jo state joint task forces which there are five to six hundred of these from terrorism task forces to, uh, you know, youth crime, to uh, drug war, to uh, gun control, all kinds of different task forces. They're actually deputized as federal agents, and then they're working for the feds on the state and local dime on their budget, and then they still get money on top of it. So this is a real scam. Here from, um, this is actually from the Department of Justice. They have a whole guide for law enforcement agencies on how to participate and explain the program. Here, they say the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury Equitable Sharing Programs, here and after called the program, enhance cooperation. Again, co enhance cooperation. They exist to bring local law enforcement into the nationalized police state. Enhance cooperation amongst federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement by providing valuable additional resources to state and local law enforcement agencies. I mean, they use some kind of nice language there, but what they're saying is, we want you working for us. We want you focusing on our priorities. We want you doing enforcing our laws because we can't do it, and we're going to throw cash at you to make that happen. However, this is totally unconstitutional all around. There is nothing about this that is authorized in the Constitution. However, they say the program is designed to supplement and enhance, not supplant, appropriated agency appropriated agency resources. So uh, they can't actually count it as their primary funding, although it is a big part of it. So we can see the different types of participants that are in this program on the federal level in the Department of Justice Equitable Sharing Program. We have the ATF, which shouldn't exist, the DEA, which shouldn't exist, the FBI, which probably shouldn't exist, but it would be good in practice, probably at this point, to get rid of it. So none of these, they're not, they're doing so many violations of the Constitution at every turn, from tracking you where you go with your license plate. That's the DEA. For almost a decade now, they've been tracking everyone's location by using automated license plate readers, red light cameras, tapping in on the states. The ATF, well, I mean, that one's pretty obvious, too. And the FBI has some of the most 
massive warrantless surveillance programs from facial recognition and others that shouldn't exist either. So these these organizations are not constitutionally sound whatsoever. So there's other components. So those are three main agencies, ATF, DEA, FBI. Then we also have uh, parts of the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, the Defense Criminal Investigation Service. I'm not going to get into the full details. Department of State, the FDA has an Office of Criminal Investigations that also par participates in this federal law enforcement civil asset forfeiture program, the United States Postal Inspection Service. And then we have the Department of Treasury participants, which include ICE, Homeland Security Investigation, the IRS, what a surprise, the Secret Service, and Customs and Border Protection. So there's a bunch of different federal agencies and organizations that participate in this. And there's two things that local law enforcement needs to do to participate in these federal programs. One, they just have to join. And here I have up on the screen, and I will link to it in the show notes. You've heard me mention it, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. If you want to find that, I will publish a blog post of this episode about one to two hours after the live stream is over. But here it's the ESAC, Equitable Sharing Agreement and Certification. They just have to fill out this short form. It's five pages. Most of it is annual reporting and some uh, – some <laughs> – some agreement information on it, but it's not very detailed at all. You just have to list your, your agency type, agency name, and then you have an annual filing, an annual certification that you have to file and submit. This is a, probably a 2008 form that I have up on the screen. I couldn't find a, a, a newer one quickly enough, and but it's, it's not much different today. So that's step one. They just have to file this ESAC form, their annual filing. And then number two, they just have to participate, and that's exactly how the DOJ puts it in their specific guide. Number one, step: how do agencies participate in the equitable sharing program? They say step one, join it. Fill out that form. File your annual report. Two, participate. In order to receive an equitable share, they point out, an agency must assist in the law enforcement effort resulting in federal forfeiture. In other words, if you want this money, you have to act as federal agents. There is no such thing as a national police, but they're using this kind of this cash handout to convince law enforcement who doesn't even have to go through the legislative process. Law enforcement does this on their own, directly with the federal government, and they've decided on their own in their own area. And almost every jurisdiction in the country, large or small, participates with the federal government in this way. They sign MOAs, memorandums of under of agreements, or MOUs, memorandums of understanding with the ATF, the DEA, and so many other uh, federal agencies that shouldn't exist. And almost all of them are signing on to this equitable sharing because they like the money that comes with it. But then they have to participate. They're not actually signing an agreement that they will participate here, but this is a really signaling. It's a strong signal that the trend is going in, well, we're going to get as much money as we can. As a general rule, and that's why organizations like Institute for Justice often call civil asset forfeiture policing for profit. Uh, not that profit is bad, and I don't necessarily like the phraseology, but that's, I mean, if they're getting paid to do stuff that they shouldn't do by organizations that shouldn't be handing out the cash in the first place, then maybe it's a good way to put it. As a general rule, the DOJ puts it, the forfeiture should follow the crime. The, if the property is seized as part of an ongoing federal investigation and the defendants are being prosecuted in federal court, the property should be federally forfeited. Should be. If the property is seized as part of an ongoing state investigation and the defendants are being prosecuted in state court, the property should be forfeited in state court, assuming the state law allows for forfeiture. I noticed that they are they're actually starting to put that kind of information in there. They didn't always put that in there before. And that's where I think it gets most interesting because there are a number of states because of the public outcry, and this is one of those areas where I am seeing left and right now working together, finding common ground in opposing this. Uh, not all the time, but more and more on this issue than on almost any other. Where you see organizations that traditionally would be at each other's heads or at each other's throats, where they're setting aside their differences and saying, let's support this restriction on civil asset forfeiture. So a number of states have either fully ended the practice of civil asset forfeiture under state law or restricted it significantly. And here's how we put it in our annual report again. I'm citing pages 78 to 79 of that 148-page report. It's a free download. You don't have to leave any information. No one's tracking you to get this other than the NSA, of course. 
But if you're not on a list at this point, you're probably not doing a good job anyways. Anyway, so uh, in response, we write, there is a growing movement to reform civil asset forfeiture laws. Several states have ended the program altogether, replacing civil forfeiture with a criminal forfeiture process. Some jurisdictions have also addressed the policing for profit motive by barring law enforcement agencies from keeping asset forfeiture proceeds. So that one of the thought processes, and I'll get to an example of that in Missouri in just a moment, is if they don't have a profit incentive, if they aren't incentivized, like if we collect this much information, then maybe the, the sheriff or the police chief won't drive his agents to do things that are helping get more money. So the thought process is if you remove that and say, well, any forfeiture proceeds are going to go to schools, for example, then that will reduce that incentive and they'll stop doing it. But we see that the federal equitable sharing program in just a moment here creates a loophole where they do it even more. So it makes it worse. Instead, they must be deposited in the general fund or some other non-law enforcement related account. So a number of states are starting to take restrictions on this. But as a response, if they only restrict it on a state level, but they don't say we're no longer going to participate in the federal equitable sharing program, you have this massive loophole. And here's how we, uh, Mike Meharry, this is an article that he published a couple of years ago. He says, even with the movement to end civil asset forfeiture at the state level, police have a federal loophole they can use. Thank you, Joe, Uncle Joe, for giving us that one, along with Uncle Strom and Uncle Ron, and you guys are all constitutional criminals that gave us this police state garbage. Anyways, even with this movement to end civil asset forfeiture at the state level, police have a federal loophole they can use to continue cashing in, even when states reform their systems and do away with the monetary incentives. Equitable sharing incentivizes prosecutors to bypass more stringent state forfeiture laws by passing cases off to the federal government. And we know that when local law enforcement works with the federal government on a joint task force, they're technically deputized as federal agents. So we have to have states actually withdraw from these state federal joint task forces on everything. I know everyone is so worried that the criminals are going to take over the world, but the criminals are running the government in Washington, D.C., and the governments in all 50 states. Those are the most, most dangerous criminals. And if we believe in a culture of self-defense, we can take care of the rest in most situations. But anyways... This is a way that gets them to actually, even if there is a restriction on civil asset forfeiture on a state level, they deputize as federal agents and then they just do it anyways. So it does nothing to stop them. In some cases, it makes it worse. And here's how Mike puts it. It works like this. State and local police work the case. And then, well, if they notice that they can't steal the car or the money or whatever property, boats, houses, there's all kinds of stuff that they take and they can't take it under state law, then they claim it involves federal law or crosses into federal jurisdiction. Well, that went across state lines. This criminal crossed state lines. So, well, I guess we got to call the ATF on this one or the DOJ, whatever it may be. Uh, this is I can find a, a federal law on just about everything. If you've got tens of thousands of regulations, pages of regulations, uh, rules, orders, acts, laws, all this stuff on the books, there's almost nothing that can't be looked at as a federal crime when they're arresting somebody or detaining. Through a process known as adoption, Mike writes, the federal government then prosecutes the forfeiture case under federal law and splits the proceeds with the local police. Through this pro program, state and local law enforcement agencies receive up to 80% of the take. And here's how IJ puts it. They say the program enables law enforcement agencies to circumvent their own state's forfeiture laws in favor of forfeiting property under federal forfeiture laws, which are in a D minus for being some of the worst in the country. So they do an annual, uh, not annual, but they've done three versions of this report called Policing for Profit, uh, where they give a grade to all the states on their civil forfeiture laws. And the federal government gets a grade as well. It's D minus. It really should be an F. Maybe they're grading on a curve. But if they're if they've got even the most modest restrictions that give them, let's say, like a C grade on a state level. But the feds are D minus. They have almost no standards or restrictions on this. Why not just partner with the feds? And then they get to keep this $100,000. Thus, they write, forfeiting property through equitable sharing may be especially appealing when a state offers property owners more protections or makes forfeiture less lucrative than federal law does. Here's an example of how it works. And this is from um, 
uh, St. Louis Public Radio, because we're going to get into it, what's going on in Missouri. As an example, police watch for suspicious cars with out-of-state license plates and then stop them for minor traffic violations. It's easy to stop someone for something. You can just say, oh, I didn't see you use your turn signal. You can pull somebody over for whatever you want if you want to. Such as, oh, that's example. <laughs> I must have read this last night. Such as changing lanes without a blinker or touching the fog line on the edge of the road. If police find occupants with suspicious stories or mannerisms, they ask to search the vehicle. If they find, <laughs> man, this takes a lot of knowledge and backbone to be able to stand up to these cops, and most people don't know what to do. If they find large amounts of cash and other suspicious circumstances, they seize the cash as drug-related, send it along to the federal government for federal forfeiture, getting back 80% to buy new equipment, computers, jail cells, guns, and ammo. So it's just highway robbery in Missouri specifically. Now we know, and Institute for Justice, and I don't even know if I have in my notes, Institute for Justice points out how often this federal program is used and it is in the tunes of the billions and billions of dollars. It actually dwarfs the amount that happens on a state level. Anyways, so in 2001, Missouri's Civil Asset Forfeiture Act, and this is very, this, you see stuff like this in a lot of states. CAFA, C-A-F-A, was amended in an effort to impede state and local law enforcement from policing for profit. This is from ACLU. A common practice in many states across the country whereby police are incentivized to seize property and pocket its cash value. But they, they changed that law in 2001. They required any fund seized to go to fund public education. The idea was that it would, as ACLU puts it, curtail law enforcement's incentive to arbitrarily and pervasively seize and then keep or cash in property allegedly involved in a crime. It sounds like, OK, well, they're not going to have the motive to take this stuff because they don't get to keep the money anymore. So that's de-incentivizing. It sounds like a good process. And Missouri, they point out, is one of a handful of states. There's not many with relatively strict civil asset forfeiture law on a state level. So if they're trying to prosecute someone under state law, then it's it's a little bit more difficult to take their property. The law itself requires a criminal conviction or a guilty plea be entered before the state government takes ownership of the seized property. Furthermore, the entirety of the state's forfeiture revenue then must be distributed to public schools. Well, how does that play out? Here's some examples. They say in 2016, local law enforcement sent $100,000 to public schools. $100,000 even though all of all of civil asset forfeiture funds is supposed to go to public schools but they seized 6.3 million dollars in 2016 so 6.3 million was seized all of it's supposed to go to public schools and only $100,000 goes there why because and of that total 44% went to the feds so i guess three some odd million my math is terrible i went to government run school so they didn't teach me a lot of basics anyway so they got three-ish million dollars, maybe three and a half million dollars to law enforcement agencies. Hundred thousand dollars went to schools. Why? Because that three and a half million was done through the federal equitable sharing program. They were told you can't see stuff and keep the loot. You can't keep the proceeds from this if you're doing it under state law. So then they just did it under federal law. And that is the total scam. So of the $19 million in cash and property value that Missouri law enforcement has seized since 2015, only 340000 of that made to school. $19 million, 340 grand. That shows the disparity of how much they'll do this under federal law. And that shows why when we push for Second Amendment Preservation Acts to ban state and local law enforcement from participating in federal gun control enforcement, why they resist it so much, because they're getting so much loot from the feds. Missouri received about, and this is from the Missouri Times, about $127 million from the federal equitable sharing program, more than $9 million per year between 2000 and 2013. In contrast, it was about 100,000, 109,000 in that same period for state level forfeitures. So it is a massive difference. That's why we support efforts like Missouri's House Bill 1613, and there's bills in other states in New Hampshire and elsewhere to opt out of the federal equitable sharing program. Even in the Missouri case, this House Bill 1613 from Tony Lovasco, which did pass out its first com committee. I haven't read the final text that's moving forward yet. 
Uh, but it would opt the state out uh, probably about 80% of the time. And I think an 80% reduction, a 10% reduction at this point would be an improvement over the status quo. And just to close it out, this whole process makes me think of a great quote from Lysander Spooner in the 1870 publication of No Treason. And he's talking about taxation. He's like, look, government is like a highway robber. And even though they're like not waiting on the side of the road to rip you off through taxation, taxation is still theft. But indeed, if you think about it, and when you hear this quote, this is really what's happening with civil asset forfeiture or with the equitable sharing program. He says, the government does not indeed waylay a man in a lonely place, spring upon him from the roadside, and holding a pistol to his head, proceed to rifle his pockets. But the robbery is nonetheless a robbery on that account, and it is far more dastardly and shameful. But they certainly do do that. They do spring upon people from the side of the road, and they do hold pistols to people's heads, or they threaten it, and they do rifle their pockets and their property, and they take their stuff, and then they try to make the people prove that the stuff was innocent, wasn't part of criminal activity, before they get it back. This is one of the worst ways that government violates people's liberty. And in fact, and as I've covered in other episodes, the vast majority of this, even though they claimed, even though uh, Uncle Joe and his buddies back in the 80s told us that this was just going to be used for organized crime, the vast majority of civil asset forfeiture is like in the small hundreds of dollars. And it's mostly against people who can't afford to defend themselves. Well, anyways, I'm going to have to actually uh, head out of here. I've got a, a deadline that I got to get to, so I'm not going to have a chance to look at the uh, the um, live chat. Uh, other than oh, I just pulled it up, Tim Dryden with a super chat over on YouTube. I really appreciate it. He says, I hope Mike Meharry is feeling better. Have him email me if you could. Thanks. Keep up the great work. I will mention that to him as well. Thank you so much for your support, Tim. Erwin Havernick says, Lysander is my hero. Awesome stuff. Anyways, I will look through these uh, comments a little bit later today. Please continue leaving them, whether it's live or in the archive, Facebook, YouTube, anywhere. Uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts. All that stuff will help trigger the algorithm, especially the mainstream platforms, and tell them to show, the, show our program to more people. It helps out a ton. And don't forget, before you head out, if you're able to support us financially, our membership program starts out as little as 2 bucks a month. Don't feel obligated to pitch in, but if you can... It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something. Uh, and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.